Well, happy Resurrection Sunday to you. You guys are looking good. Uh, you look a little tight and packed in out there, so love your neighbor. That's what the Jesus said. You know, don't get mad with them or anything like that. Just enjoy them. If you have a Bible this morning, I would invite you to turn to Luke chapter 23 with me. If you don't, I'll put it on the screen. It's not a big deal. But I, I do want to say this morning that it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? And I'm so grateful for the baptisms. We got a couple at 11 o'clock as well. So thank you for being here. I want to begin this morning by sharing with you a message. And, and I will say this, the message is a little shorter today, just because I know that this is one of those days where you're so tightly packed, but it's okay. I want to talk to you about unconditional love. I want to talk to you about the message of the cross. It was August the 31st of 2005. It was about 1.20 in the afternoon. It was a Wednesday. We had an Awana ceremony that night. So this has been 18 years ago, August 31st. I received a phone call from my oldest brother. And on the other end of the phone, he said, Kenny, I think dad just died. You need to come to the shop right now. I jumped in my car, I ran over to my dad's shop. An automotive shop is where my dad and my brothers worked. And when I walked in the door, my dad was laying on the floor and the paramedics were there and they were giving him CPR. And I realized that he was already gone. My dad died that day. And I'll never forget uh, previous to that where he had been to the doctors and they told him that he had one open artery in his heart and they said, you should just live until you die. Because when the day comes that this something happens, even if you were laying on the table, on my operating table, there would be nothing that I could do to help you. So don't protect yourself, just go live. And we did that. He did that for a couple of years. My dad had, been, had received Christ as his Savior two years prior to his death. And I remember when I walked into that room and, and my mom showed up and I was holding my mom. And we knew. We knew that he was gone. It was a tough day for me. I had been saved a number of years earlier in 1989, February 28th of 1989. Prior to that, uh, I was lost. I didn't know anything about Jesus. I got saved. Everything was awesome. It was a time of celebration. It was a time of excitement. I ultimately went off to seminary, came back to be the pastor. I've been the pastor for 10 years. Every Sunday, I would preach about Christ, about his sacrifice, about forgiveness, about the life that he came to give us. And it was incredible to do that. But until August 31st of 2005, I really had not had a reason to say, boy, do I have real faith or do I have religion? You see, religion is a set of rules that helps you behave in this life and lets other people know that you behaved and you did good in this life. But faith is a trust in God and his son and what he did on Calvary that helps you in the next life. This life, sure, but also in the next life. And I was confronted on that day because when my dad passed away and he was laying on the ground and there was nothing that I could do, and they finally told me, you know, they, he died there in the shop, but they put him in an ambulance, they carried him away, and of course their statement was that he passed on the way to the hospital. Well, he had already passed, and I knew that. But it was on that day that I was confronted with my faith. See, prior to that was easy because everybody that I knew was alive. So it wasn't necessary for my faith to be ultimately real, although it was, but it never really been challenged because I didn't have to come face to face with death the way that I did and to see, realize its pain, to realize its abruptness, uh, to realize that it is unconcerned with who you are. And really the reality of permanent loss, of recognizing that my dad was never, ever, ever coming back. And where was he? And I really had to think about that at that time. The message of Easter has always been something very special to me because it cuts right to the heart of that question. Do you have religion or do you have faith? Did my dad make it or did he not make it? Will I make it one day? Will you make it one day? 
especially when we live in a world where there's so much diversity about what people say that they believe and what's right and what's wrong and is there truth and is anything absolute. Well, I happen to still be one of those people that believes in absolute truth because the people that tell me there are no truth, there is no truth, believe that absolutely. And that would have to be absolute, which is stupid. So um, I don't want to get too far into that this morning. But when I look at this message of the cross and I boil it down, because depending on who you talk to, wherever you come from, whatever church background you're from, or no church background, or whatever you think, or whatever your ideologies are, there is a message that comes every year that we highlight, and that is the message of Resurrection Sunday. It's the message of Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. And it answers all of the questions that need to be answered. I know this might be hard for you to receive, but because we live in a very different world, but many, many years ago, in fact, for the majority of history, the majority of humanity has never been able to read. There was no reason to read. There was, we always had language. We didn't always have literature. And so there were, there were people that kind of held that real close to the chest and they would share and they were our leaders. So in reference to that, whenever God came, God put so many pictures out there. The reason that he taught in metaphor and parable and things like that was because he needed to draw pictures for people to be able to see, to hear, and to understand. When we think about the message of Calvary, the message is wrapped around a Savior on a cross. There's only one cross here, but there were two other crosses on that day. And those two crosses that were beside, that flanked Jesus on either side were crosses that held the message to humanity. And both of those were thieves. It wasn't like there was a good man on his right and a bad man on his left. There were two thieves on either side of Jesus, and they represented humanity. And they represented the choices that humanity gets to make. And both of them being lost, both of them being nailed to a cross, had to make a decision on that day. And for me as a pastor, I've been off to seminary, I've done a whole lot of stuff, but it really doesn't make any difference. What makes a difference is what does the Scripture teach? So in Luke chapter 23 this morning... In just a few moments, I really want to share with you the message of Calvary. What, what does it tell us? And it tells us something about salvation, but the true message is the message of unconditional love. And I want to emphasize the word unconditional because many of us feel like there's a condition associated with it. So I want to read Luke chapter 23. The Bible says this. This is the conversation between the two criminals in which Jesus did not interject. He just listened. And here's what they said. One of the criminals who were hanged, blasphemed Jesus, saying, if you're the Christ, save yourself and us. There's always those who have questions about what Jesus did. But the other answering rebuked this other guy, and he said to him, do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation as he is, and that we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And so he has an acknowledgement of their situation, his own situation, and that of Jesus. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me whenever you come into your kingdom. And only then does Jesus respond. And he says, assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. In that brief moment, Jesus lets us know what salvation is all about. I can remember whenever I first came to church, I didn't grow up in church I was 27 years old whenever I was saved. I came in late in life. Had it not been for my wife who was a church goer, I probably would have never come to church. I felt like that all church people were hypocrites and liars. I'd come in, they say they love me, and I was like, you love my wallet. And, and that's how I felt. I felt like that the church always wanted the money. Then I figured out that that wasn't exactly true. But whenever I came down to trying to figure out what is this whole thing about the gospel? What is this being born again? What does it mean to be saved? And what was interesting to me is that a lot of church people couldn't give me those answers. That there was a different message from everybody. And I thought, are we not reading the same Bible? Can we not come to that one message? And so in Luke, between these two criminals that are on either side of Jesus, I found the bottom line message of Jesus Christ. I want to share it with you this morning. So I want to take a minute. I want to give you four things that he shared. Number one, and this is a big deal. Number one, Jesus holds all of us, all of us, 0% responsible for being a sinner. 
I think that that's the hardest thing for a religious person to accept. Now, it's not hard for a lost person to accept, but for people that come to church, that's a bit much. That's a big thing to, to bite in. You mean to tell me that I am not responsible for being a sinner? That's what I'm telling you. And that's what I'm telling you that the Bible teaches. Let me, let me show it to you. Let me prove it to you. First of all, I want you to see that God did not leave up to me to figure this out. He showed me what his understanding was of the sinfulness of man. Now, I'm abbreviating this a lot. You can go back and study this for yourself. But here's basically what Jesus said. In Romans chapter 5, Paul writes these words as to the origins of our sin. He says, just as through one man, sin entered into the world. Through one man, sin entered into the world. And then death came through sin. And all death spread to all men because all sinned. And so here's what Paul said. He says, I want you to understand something. That the first sinner, which was Adam in the garden, is where sin came from. And it passed down to everybody. So the issue that we're looking at in front of us is this issue of sin. And what was its origin? Its origin was Adam. Its origin was not you. You got it passed down to you. Jesus in John chapter 3 and verse 16 reminds Nicodemus of this great truth. He says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish. And so the emphasis and the focus there was not on working your way around the law. It was in believing in Jesus Christ. Because he goes on to say this, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And so this emphasis becomes on belief. Now here's the challenge. The issue of sin is a birth issue. You were born in a condition of sin. So the reason that you would be condemned to hell today is not because of anything that you've done. It's the fact that you were born. Let me, let me give you a clear, easy understanding of what I mean. For those of you who have been here for any length of time, or for the first time you're here, and you've looked at me, some people will say, what is this dude? Is he white? Partially. As some would say, is he Chinese? Partially. Partially. Do you speak Chinese? I do. Egg roll, egg foo young, fried rice. Yes, I got a little bit of that in there. Okay, but here's the deal. I'm part white and part Chinese. And by the way, that is an issue of birth. I did not get to choose my parents. I did not get to choose the year in which I was born. I did not get to choose the country in which I was born the state in which I was born, the time in which I was born, the hospital in which I was born, the doctor who birthed me. I didn't get to choose any of that stuff. All of that is an issue of birth. Well, guess what? I didn't get to choose whether I would be born with a sin nature. That was an issue of birth. And for all of you, the reason that you're a sinner is an issue of birth and God does not hold you responsible for being a sinner. Zero percent. But secondly, oh, I'm out of the clear. Well, what? You're not out of the clear yet. Okay. Number two, God holds everyone 100% responsible for their sin. He doesn't hold you responsible for becoming the sinner, but he does now hold you responsible for any sins that you may commit. Romans chapter two, verse 11 through 16 says this as Paul was speaking, and this whole situation is there's two kind of categories of people in the world that they're talking about. One of those is the Jewish nation, God's chosen and elected people. And then the other are the rest of the people. We're all considered Gentiles, which is a translation of the word ethne, where we get our word ethnic. So all every other ethnic group of people out there are considered Gentiles. And those two people were always battling back and forth with each other as to whether the chosen people of God got an automatic pass right into heaven and the rest of the people did not. And so Paul wrote these words. He says, and by the way, you ever heard this? What about the people in Africa that's never heard about Jesus? This was Paul's response. He says, number one, there is no partiality with God. Now, if you were to break that down to the original language, here's what it means. It literally translates, God doesn't see your face. So when God's dealing with somebody, he doesn't see your face. He's not dealing with you because of who you are. He deals with you as a human, just like he does everybody else. A number of years ago, my wife and I were flying back from the Southern Baptist Convention, 
and Mike Morley was with me and his wife. And as we were flying back on the plane, my, my wife hates to fly. She always thinks the plane's going to crash. But we were coming back from the convention, and as a result of coming back, there were a lot of pastors that were there. And on my particular plane that we were flying on, there must have been 20 or so pastors that were flying back on our airplane. Now, I don't know if y'all know this or not, but I was one of those pastors. Right? I was one of those pastors. But there was a guy on there, and he was in his, I think he was 91 years old. His name was J. Harold Smith, and he was a a very old, aged pastor and a very uh, respected, well-respected man of God. And my wife turned to me, she said, I feel a little more comfortable on this airplane. I said, why? She said, because J. Harold Smith's on the airplane. (laughs) Do you know that God's not a respecter of persons? He doesn't care if J. Harold was on there or whether Kenny Chin was on there. It didn't make any difference. God is no respecter of persons. And so it says, as many as has sinned without the law, that's the Gentiles, will also perish without the law. Oh my goodness. And as many have sinned with the law, that is the Jews, will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when the Gentiles, that's all of us, who do not have the law, who have never heard about Jesus, by nature do the things that are in the law, although they don't have the law, are a law to themselves. So you've judged yourself who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness between themselves and their thoughts, accusing or excusing them. So you're the one accusing or excusing yourself in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. And so he says, hey, even if you are in church, you're you're not in church, you're Jew, you're Gentile or whatever, God holds you 100% responsible for this issue of your sin. There's got to be a payment for that sin. But thirdly, so we got a, a 0% responsibility for being a sinner, 100% responsibility for our sin. But thirdly, God holds you 0% responsible for earning your salvation or for paying for your sin. He realizes that you can't any more than I could. In Romans, here's what God says as he speaks back and forth about this law. Paul says this. He says, we know that whatever the law says It says to those who are under the law, that's speaking of the Jews, so that every mouth may be stopped. Because who was running their mouth? The Jews. Why were the Jews running their mouth? Because they felt like because they were the chosen people of God, that they got a free pass to heaven, and they didn't have to talk to God about it. And they felt like that they were better than the Gentiles that were out there. And God says, I sent the Jews the law so that they would understand just because they're my chosen people doesn't mean they, got, they don't have to choose me back. Let me tell you what that means. If you have like a really, really close friend and you had an invitation only uh, party that you were having, who is it that thinks that they don't need the invitation? Your close friends. They think they can just show up without an invitation. It's like, no, no, everybody has to have an invitation. Nobody can get in without an invitation. Yeah, but I'm their close friend. It won't really make any difference. It's like, no, in fact, you're the one that needs the invitation more than anybody else because you're the one that don't think you need it. And that's what God was saying. He says, he's not a respecter of persons. And so you've got to be able to come in. He says, so that all the world might be guilty become before God. The Gentiles already knew they were guilty, but the Jews didn't. So he wanted to make sure that they knew. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And if you really think about it, every time that there's a new law passed, what happens? We become worse sinners. We really do. I've, I've, it's always amazing that if you go by a wet paint sign, why do you have to touch it? Like you would never think about touching wet paint until you saw the sign that said wet paint. You never think about walking on the grass until it says don't walk on the grass. Watch me. (laughs) You never even thought about it until somebody told you not to do it. He says that's what happens. The law makes gives you the knowledge of sin. But now he says in Jesus Christ, the righteousness, which means simply means to be lined up with God. The righteousness of God, listen to these next three words, four words, apart from the law. There's a righteousness and alignment with God that's apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, witnessed by it, not drawn from it. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, that's what it's all about. To all and on all who believe. So it's available to everybody. Why? Because there's no difference. 
because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. And he, when he said all, he meant all. And he was really speaking to the Jews to say, you guys too. Everybody has to come. There's no difference between you and them. We're all the same. In Galatians, he reaffirms this. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Could that be any clearer? Even we have believed in Christ Jesus. This is what Paul's saying. He's a Jew. He says, we know, since we know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, we Jews have also come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we all know this, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast. Christ knew that you didn't need to do anything because he'd already done everything, and you didn't need to do a thing. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, this is the verse that turned me. This really turned me whenever I was uh, many, many years ago when I received Christ. This was the one that got me because when I first started coming to church, I kept trying to figure out, what have I got to do? Do I have to dress right? Do I have to act right? Do I have to pray right? Do I have to give the money? Uh, do I need to be nice? What, what have I got to do? And then I read Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 that said this. It said, God demonstrated his love, his unconditional love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I was like, okay, I meet that criteria. I'm still a sinner. And he died for me in the midst of my sin. So you're 0% responsible for being a sinner. You're 100% responsible for your sin, but God holds you 0% responsible for paying for it. So what's left? What's left? God holds you 100% responsible for receiving your salvation. You have to receive it. You have to take it. This is the hardest part for mankind. The gospel is so simple, but it's hard to receive because man always wants to have some part of what he does. And this is none of you and all of him. You just have to accept it. So I want to read a long passage of scripture. I'll just make a couple of comments. I'm almost done. Okay. Romans 10 says this. Here's Paul talking about his own people, the Jewish nation, God's chosen and elected people who think they're saved because they're God's chosen and elected people. And he's concerned because he knows that being chosen and being elected doesn't make you saved. God chose Pharaoh to work with his people a long time ago. They didn't make him saved. And so here's what he says about his own people. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, that's my people, is that they may be saved. Oh, that's an offensive statement to the Jewish nation because they feel like that they're God's chosen elected people. He says, my prayer is that they would be saved because I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. In other words, the nation of Israel was very much like some of our faith today, some of our religions today, some of our denominations today. We have a passion. We have an emotion for God, but it is not lined up with the knowledge of Scripture. So we feel deep in our heart that we've had a relationship with Jesus. Yeah, but you, did you do what he said to do? Did you do what he said to do? And sometimes we have a hard time recognizing, we really feel like that God's gonna fudge on that. And I'm telling you that he's not gonna fudge. God has a very specific way of being saved. Neither you get saved that way or you don't get saved at all. But they felt like, man, we're real passionate. We've got the law, we've got the covenants, we've got all this stuff. So we know that God's gonna, is gonna receive us in. And Paul says, hey, these, these folks have a real zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So here's what they did. They being ignorant of God's righteousness, in other words, God said, here's how you do it. And they're like, we don't want to know that. They were ignorant of it. They sought, to, they sought to establish their own righteousness. We'll make up our own way of getting there by the deeds of the law. And therefore, they've not submitted to the righteousness of God. In other words, when God says, no, it's Jesus, they say, no, we're not going to do that. He says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes don't you think it would have been a whole lot different if God would have said to everyone who behaves? Sometimes I need to tell you what he didn't say so that you hear what he did say. He didn't say for everyone who behaves, for everyone who does everything right. He said to everyone who believes. 
And then he gives an illustration. He says, Moses writes about the righteousness that is of the law, and it's a works righteousness. He says, here's what he says. The man who does those things shall live by them. If we were to go back, you would discover that the scripture teaches that when it comes to the 10 commandments that Moses gave us, that the teaching was, if you break one of them, you're guilty of all of them. God help me. He said, well, have you broken one? I'm, I think I've broken eight of them. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I broke eight. Seven. Somebody's like, Whoa. <laughs> I think it's seven. <laughs> sure. Either way, God holds me guilty of all of them. So he goes on to say this. He says, but the righteousness of faith speaks this way. What is the first thing that the righteousness of faith, that's putting your faith in Christ. What is the first thing it teaches us? Don't go the works route. Don't go the works route. He says this. He says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? Do I got to climb up there to get him, to bring Christ down from above? Who will ascend into heaven? Or, or who will descend into the earth so that we can bring Christ up from the dead? He says, don't say that. He says, but what does the righteousness of faith say? This is the word of faith which we preach, that if it's near you, it's near you in your heart and in your mouth. Here it is. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So he says, look, you don't have to go find him up there. You don't have to find him down there. He's in here. And it's a matter of a belief of your heart and a confession of your mouth. And he says, it's, it's right there, right for you right now. Right now today, you can have this. And whenever it comes to these two guys on the cross that are beside Jesus, I want you to see how they did this. Because Jesus didn't turn and, I don't know if you noticed this or not, Jesus didn't turn and witness to these two guys. He didn't say, hey, if you will confess me, you'll be, as far as we know, Jesus didn't say anything to those two guys. Now he did speak to the crowd that was out there. And I'm supposing that these guys were listening. But as they began to speak, there was something really that I thought was pretty interesting. Whenever that one thief says, Lord, remember me whenever you come into your kingdom, Jesus' response to him was this. He says, assuredly, I say to you that today you will be with me in paradise. And so Jesus tells this guy, hey, I'm gonna die a little bit, go into paradise because of your profession, you're coming with me. What picture did he give for us to see on that particular day? Well, we had one person that was a thief. So we already know that he had no ability to go to heaven. He was already a judged criminal. We had two of them. One of them just said, I, whatever, Lord, will you help me out? And Christ said, yes. The other one said, prove it. And he never made it so far as we know. But the one who was saved for me helped me because here's what he did. He destroyed religion. Never been a religious guy, still not a religious guy. Don't like religion. Religion is a man's way of trying to get to God. Faith is God's way of coming to man. You just merely need to receive Jesus. But let me tell you something about what this guy did. And let's go back now. Let's go back. This is in the early years, right? This is in the year 33 or 30 AD, somewhere in that range when Jesus died. Let me tell you what this thief on the cross didn't have. Number one, he didn't have any ability. The man's nailed to a cross. He can't shake his hand. He can't do anything. He can't raise his hands. He can't do anything. He has zero ability because he's being killed on a cross. So he has no ability to do anything. He has no theology. He's never been to seminary. He's never sat in a church. He's never gone to a Bible study. He's never been in a small group. He's never studied the book of Romans or the book of John. or anything. He's never done any of that. As far as he knows, he's not even a religious guy. He's just a thief that's on a cross. So he has no theology. He has no belief. He has no understanding of anything. Uh-oh, we're in trouble now. The man didn't get baptized. How did he make it? Do you know how many people have told me that baptism is a requirement of heaven? No, baptism is an advertisement for heaven. It's an advertisement for our relationship with God. It is us declaring to the world that we're associated with Jesus, but it doesn't save you. It tells people you've been saved. And this thief on the cross, you're going to have to prove that baptism is saved. He didn't get baptized, man. He didn't have a chance to get baptized. He never gave a tithe. 
The, the man was a thief. He didn't have any money, and any money he had, he had already stolen. And so he didn't have a chance to drop any money in the offering plate. And yet Jesus still said he was going to make it. He didn't have a church membership. How are you going to make it without a church membership? You know, the church actually didn't even come into existence for 50 days after Jesus' crucifixion or after his resurrection. So the church hadn't even come into existence yet. What church? Any church. That means the Baptist church, the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church, the Catholic church, none of them existed. How is that possible? How could a man go to heaven without the sanction of the church? See, the church didn't exist. Apparently, the church isn't needed to go to heaven. Christ is needed, but the church is not needed. Man had no Bible. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. It had been spoken by Jesus. It was in the hearts and the minds of the believers, but it hadn't been written yet. It was going to be a number of years before they even put it in print. So he had no Bible. Uh, he had no changed life to prove that anything had happened because he's nailed to a cross, getting ready to die in just a few minutes. They're going to break his legs and it's all going to be over with. So he didn't have anything to prove anything. And yet Jesus said, you're going to be with me in paradise. He had no denomination. The denominations didn't exist. You know, we Baptists, we think we're the only ones going to be in heaven. Uh, there's the old joke where uh, there's people, you know, the Presbyterians are in heaven and they're walking by and the angel says, shh, get me past the Baptists. Why am I being quiet? They think they're the only ones here. You know, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of the old joke. There are no denominations. There's no catechisms, no last rites, no absolution. The Catholic Church, the priest didn't exist yet. So what makes you think that you need any of that? He never obeyed the law. He was a lawbreaker. He was a malefactor, according to the scriptures. He was a thief. He was a lawbreaker. So he never obeyed that. This one, I really, it blows my mind that this is even a possibility you can get to heaven. He never sang a hymn. He was not necessarily an advocate of Southern gospel music. And he never had the opportunity to complain about the contemporary stuff. <laughs> still made it. He still made it. What did he have? What did he have? The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you would be saved. What did the scripture say? He said, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. If he was going to die dead like a dog, there's no kingdom that he's going to. This man fulfilled the responsibilities of the gospel, nailed to a cross. And I can tell you this, neutrality is not an option. John 3.18 says this, he who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Notice what's missing. He didn't say he who was good, he who is better, he who paid their tithes, he who had been baptized, uh, he who sang a hymn, he who prayed, he who you preached, he who had done all these. He says, he who believes in him. My dad believed in Jesus. He grew up Catholic. He was Catholic all of his life. I'm not picking on the Catholic church. But here's what I do know. My dad banked his salvation for many, many, many years on a catechism he did over the summer. He said a nun told him one time that if he did this for 12 weeks, that his security and salvation would be locked in. Two years before my dad died, he came to the knowledge that it was Christ and Christ alone. Gave his heart to Jesus. I had the privilege of baptizing him in our other building over there. Because my dad went ahead and traded in his religion for a relationship with Jesus Christ. How many of you today are certain? I mean, really certain. I heard a preacher say this this week and I thought it was appropriate for what he said. He said this. That dude on the cross, that thief on the cross that made it, for all of heaven that gets in there, whenever Christ comes and says, why should I let you in? He said, I think here would be his response. And I think it's the right response. That dude on the middle cross said I could. I think 
that's pretty much the right answer. How about you this morning? Today is Resurrection Sunday. If you go back into the Old Testament, whenever a sacrifice was made by the high priest, if it wasn't accepted, the high priest who offered it died to show that it was an unacceptable offering. The Bible teaches us that Jesus played a dual role in his crucifixion resurrection. He was the offering and he was the high priest. When the high priest would come out from behind the veil, alive, everybody knew that for that year, they were forgiven for a whole year because the offering was accepted and the priest was alive. The resurrection of Jesus is God's way stemming from an Old Testament picture that the offering which Christ made, which was himself, he as our high priest made that offering. When he rose from the dead and came out from behind the veil and tore that veil from top to bottom, it was God's way of saying, the offering is accepted. And if you will receive him, I will place your sin on his account and place his righteousness on your account and you'll become my child. It's the greatest transaction ever made. It's happened to me. And man, life is good. If it hasn't happened to you, today's a good day. Today's a good day. If you're watching by way of internet, if you just hit that raise your hand emoji, some, we'll, we'll try to connect with you. For those of you who are in here, there'll be some folks right up here at the front. And if you have any need whatsoever, please come and let us help you. I'll be out front if you need to talk to me. I hope you'll come. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for Resurrection Sunday. What a good day. But Lord, today can be a day of salvation. It's available right now. Nobody has to go anywhere. It's in our heart. It's in our mouth. And regardless of whatever we've done, you said that you demonstrated your love for us, this unconditional love, by dying for us while we were still a sinner. If you waited until we got a little better, it might you know, say something different. But the way you wanted it to be was that we didn't change at all. Nothing has shifted with the exception that we trust Jesus for what he did on Calvary, for our sin and for our salvation. Today, Father, if there are those who are willing to do that today, I pray they will come. There will be folks here to help them. I ask you to save those who are lost and for those of us who are saved to even further solidify our understanding that the reason we're on our way to you is because of you and you alone and that you might elevate our gratefulness in life and let us carry this message out to the generations. Help us to drop our religion and elevate our relationship to understand it's great to be in a church. Denominations are awesome. We love all of that, but they do not take the place of the blood that was shed on Calvary. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you guys have need, you can come. If not, you're dismissed. God bless you. Happy Easter. I'll meet you out front. Thank you so much for coming.